hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. And uh, if you're joining us from places to the west of Turkey, good afternoon. And even good morning, I suppose, to those of you dialing in from Western United States, like our speaker today. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us on this World Press Freedom Day. My name is Yasin Chongar. I'm the director and the co-founder of P24. As some among you might know, P24 has been organizing a lecture to mark World Press Freedom Day in honor and memory of a dear colleague, esteemed Turkish journalist Mehmet Ali Birant, every year since 2014. In the six years since, the fate of press freedom and more generally the freedom of expression in Turkey has gone from bad to worse. I won't make a speech today, but as we begin this year's lecture, I'd like to remind you all that 102 journalists and media workers are behind bars in Turkey's prisons at the moment. They should never have been sent to prison in the first place. And if the law, no, when the law prevails, we believe they will be all duly acquitted, simply because journalism is not a crime. But our hope, our wish, our demand for them is simple and straightforward. With the additional risk of a deadly virus now in Turkey's prisons, we want all 102 of our colleagues to be released as a matter of urgency. And with that, I would like to ask Andrew Finkel, also a co-founder and an executive board member of P24, to chair our meeting today. Andy, please. Yes, I mean, thank you very much um, for, for, for setting the tone. Um, this is World Press Freedom Day, but as you say, we always begin these occasions by saying it's not so much a celebration, but something that we aspire to. Um, uh, we wish we were free, but we don't enjoy that freedom. And we, it's a day to mark out that aspiration, but also to remember people who do not enjoy that freedom because of something that they wrote for something that they believed in for exercising a right to free expression. And those people are in Belmarsh prison, those people are in Silivri prison. Um, and as you say, with the pandemic at the gate, um, even without the pandemic at the gate, they shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be here. I mean, I, there's a, there's a, I'm not going to sing it, but but there's there's a there's a lyric that keeps buzzing around in my head. It, 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 it's at the end of Robert Altman's film Nashville, and someone belts out this anthem and says, "You can say that we ain't free, but it don't worry me." Well, it, we we are worried, and and we wish we were free, and 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 we understand that 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 we don't always enjoy those feelings. But at the same time, the fact that so many of us from around the world, um, not just on this Zoom call, but on Zoom calls elsewhere, on, on celebrations elsewhere, that people are really trying to do um, the right thing and um, to try and be free. And to try and be free is, to my mind, is a sort of a type of freedom. And, and, and that's sort of what we're, we're celebrating. Um, and we do so in the name of someone called Mehmet Ali Birant, who, as you say, was a, a he was a decent journalist. He was just a decent man. He was a man who people trusted, who, who trusted, he trusted his audience, he respected his audience, he respected accuracy, he respected all the things that journalists are meant to respect. And um, the further we are from his death six or seven years ago, the, the, the brighter the, the light that he, that he lit shines. It, it's, it's, it's become a sort of beacon for us in, in a day when people don't always respect the truth and people don't always try and do the right thing and people confuse their audiences as much as respect them. Um, um, so we are here you know, to listen to, as I'll say in a second, a, a really very precise, forensic, really important um, analysis of the age in which we live. Um, 
I have to say that all the previous six speakers have all also really tapped into to the, the time in which they were writing. We, we, the first person to give this address was someone called Ahmed Altan, who has just celebrated his 70th birthday in, and is 100 in, what is it, the 1300th day in prison um, for something that he wrote. Um, we remember Peter Preston, who was uh, the editor of the Guardian and of the Observer, who gave the second lecture and, and sadly is no longer with us. Um, um, I have to say most most of our speakers in are, are not quite so unlucky. Um, we had Zaina Erheim, the, the, the Syrian citizen journalist, talk to us about the sort of the folly of objectivity. Um, we had Carol Giacomo from the New York Times editorial board and Philip Sands, so who gave a very powerful speech. And I think last year was was in some ways uh, a remarkable speech by this young Kurdish journalist, Beritan Chanazar, who, who really just sort of laid into us and, and, and showed it what it really, the, you know, there, there are people who still really know and respect and understand what it means to, to report and to be witness to events. Um, and so, um, but we're also very grateful that up until now, we've been fortunate that these talks have happened in the Swedish consulate in Istanbul, which must be one of the most beautiful buildings in the city. And, and, and there's a lot of competition for, the, for that title in Istanbul. And, and um, we were very fortunate to be hosted by, by uh, the Swedish consul general in the, in the Swedish consulate. If you look to your right, you can see the background of the Swedish consulate because the Swedish consul general, Peter Eriksson, has um, kindly decided to be with us this evening. and, and uh, it's a pleasure to ask him to, to, to make a few remarks. Peter. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'm really very happy to be here. I'm uh, the new Consul General of Sweden in Istanbul since September of last year. And this, uh, what we're experiencing tonight, is a duty that I'm really ha happy to have inherited from my predecessors. So it's the seventh time. and. Uh, Unfortunately, this time it's only me here in the Swedish palace. It's empty, Istiklal Street outside, where usually tens of thousands of people would be walking this time of day, is also empty. Uh, and of course, that is a sad situation. Uh, compounded, as uh, Yasmin pointed out, uh, with the situation of press freedom and jailed journalists here in Turkey. Um, I do hope that we can come back here next year for this event. In the meantime, uh, we're making use of the fact that this event is virtual and I'm very proud to be able to hand over to my boss, the uh, Foreign Minister of Sweden, Anne Linde, who will uh, explain our position on the issue of freedom of the press. Please. Good evening. As Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, I want to greet you on the World Press Freedom Day. The coronavirus pandemic has had a global impact in so many ways. Too many governments around the world have taken the opportunity to limit freedom, control information and extend their own power. Freedom of the media, freedom of expression and freedom of thought from the basis not only for a well-functioning democracy, but for a well-functioning society as a whole. Sweden has a long track record of supporting free media, independent journalists, and human rights and civil society in Turkey, through our consulate general in Istanbul and through SIDA in Ankara. You know you can count on us. I understand that this is the seventh time the consulate general of Sweden in Istanbul celebrate World Press Freedom Day together with P24. I hope you will be able to host it in the Swedish Palace next year. So best wishes to all of you, organizers, participants, viewers, and of course to David Kay, whose tireless work for freedom of expression and opinion I salute. Thank you for listening. And, and thank you for, <laughs> for that, that very charming intervention, uh, which we very much uh, appreciate. Um, it wouldn't be World Press Freedom Day without a, a word from uh, Jeme Berant, who is 
not just the widow of Mehmet Ali Durand, but also the, the more than the Emin al she was a powerful force in, 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 in his production company and making his work possible. Uh, she, comes, she comes from a great journalist family and, and has always been very um, supportive and encouraging uh, of this event. So unfortunately, she's in the countryside somewhere, so, but she too has pre-recorded her remarks. And so I'm, um, I'm happy to, to welcome Jemre as we have uh, every year. Uh, Jemre Durant Lecture to you. Welcome to Mehmet Ali Durant Lectures organized by the Platform for Independent Journalism. Today is the 3rd of May, World Press Freedom Day. We are part of the world passing through a hor horrifying experience. We are part of the press world, but the press is not the same in Turkey as it is in the world. As for freedom, it depends on where you are on the list of freedom of the press. Mehmet Ali Birant, my husband, was a man of firsts. He was the first person to talk about military tutelage in the Turkish political system when nobody else talked about it. He was the first to say that the Kurdish problem cannot be solved by military means. He was objective, he was liberal, he was a democrat, and he always stood by in what he believed in. He was brave, but not knowing that he was brave. Mehmet Ali Birad will be remembered in his numerous articles, in his books, and in the many documentaries he did that shed light on the Turkish political life. I would like to end my little speech with a few words from the Turkish national anthem. And it goes with, don't be afraid, Korkma. Good advice, um, Korkma, don't be afraid. Um, and we have a particularly fearless um, speaker uh, who is about to address us. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, to have David Kay, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom. Um, he's also uh, cl the Clinical Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine. Um, he first, uh, we first met him, I first met him when he conducted an official visit to Turkey in 2016, um, reporting to the Human Rights Council. And in that report, he expressed his grave concerns about the government's repression of journalism and freedom of expression uh, more broadly, both online and offline. Uh, he's a pro prolific author. His last book was this Speech Police Global Struggle to Govern the Internet. Um, and his reporting for the UN has addressed a huge number of topics, among other things, encryption and anonym anonymity, the protection of whistleblowers and journalistic sources, the regulation of online content by social media and search companies. It doesn't stop there. He's wrote about artificial intelligence, technology, and human rights, and the private surveillance industry and online hate. Um, his speech this evening, um, it very much addresses the era that we live in, the, the weeks and hours and days, the fact that we're having to do this by Zoom and not uh, among ourselves. Um, the, name, the, the title of his talk is, ends with a question mark, but it begins, Pathogen of Repression. Uh, I turn the microphone over to David Kay. How can you have an opinion if you are not informed? In 11 words, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt summed up the theory connecting Article 19.1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which protects everyone's right to hold opinions without interference, with the guarantee in Article 19, Paragraph 2, to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. She also noted, quote, if everybody always lies, nobody believes anything any longer. And a people that no longer can believe anything cannot make up its mind. It is deprived not only of its capacity to act, but also of its capacity to think and to judge. And with such a people, you can then do what you please. Arendt knew of what she spoke. A scholar of totalitarianism forced to flee Nazi Germany, she presented the rights to opinion, expression, access to information, autonomy, 
self-governance in much the same way that the covenant and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promote de democratic values and pr protect human life. While she had in mind the kind of propaganda that facilitates authoritarianism, her point extends to all nature of government practices that interfere with the individual's ability to develop informed opinions and to take action consistent with those opinions. At this particular moment in history, we all can see exactly what she had in mind and why the drafters of the covenant and of the declaration 20 years before it believed it essential to guarantee expression. We are now living in a time of pandemic. Let's be hopeful, hopeful that it shocks the global public into recognition of the need for international coordination and cooperation, that it serves as a jolting wake up call, that censorship of all sorts interferes with a range of human rights, that promoting access to information bolsters the promotion of health, life, autonomy, and good governance, and that restrictions, even where aimed towards a legitimate objective, must meet the standards of legality, necessity, and proportionality. But too often today, we see opportunism, consolidation of authoritarian power, and disproportionate use of executive authorities. We see a pathogen of disease acting also as a pathogen of repression. Seen from this perspective, the pandemic is a crisis of free expression, naturally caused but facilitated by information policies that have weakened the infrastructures of warning and reporting. Individuals and their communities, however, cannot protect themselves against disease when information is denied to them, when they have diminished trust in sources of information, and when propaganda and disinformation dominate the statements of public authorities. Let me begin with some generalities. The World Health Organization's guidance for dealing with information in the context of pandemics highlights the importance of the state providing reliable information to the public. It does not answer some of the most pertinent questions. What are the state's obligations when it comes to keeping the public educated about the pandemic? To what extent may the public have access to information concerning the pandemic? May a state impose restrictions to ensure that the public receives only legitimate information sanctioned by government authorities? May a state impose restrictions on the media concerning the reporting of the pandemic? International human rights law, especially that related to freedom of expression, goes hand in glove with public health and to answering these kinds of questions. Article 19, paragraph two of the covenant robustly defines freedom of expression as one that is multi-directional, unlimited by, by viewpoint, without boundaries and open-ended in form. The third paragraph of Article 19 allows for narrow grounds on which governments may restrict the freedom of expression, requiring that any limitation be provided by law and be necessary for respect of the rights or reputations of others or for the protection of national security or public order or for public health or morals. The principles of legality, necessity, and proportionality apply across the board they are not simply discarded in the context of efforts to address the public health threat of COVID-19. To the contrary, they apply with great force because of the extraordinary value that the covenant places on free expression and because they also advance public health policies. It can never become necessary to derogate from the freedom of opinion during a state of emergency. But given the importance of information and freedom of expression, to the development of opinion and to the efforts to address the public health crisis, states should also avoid any derogation from their obligations under Article 19. Article 19 already provides sufficient grounds for necessary and proportionate restrictions to protect public health. Moreover, in accordance with Article 4 of the Covenant, even in the context of a declared public emergency, emergency which threatens the life of the nation, Measures derogating from a state party's obligations under, under the covenant must be limited to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation and as under the normal application of Article 19 cannot involve discrimination 
or other violations of other international legal obligations, and they must be temporary. So with those general views, let me turn to four challenges, not, exhaust, not exhaustive, but ones of real concern. And first, I'll begin with access to information held by public authorities. Article 19 of the Covenant has been interpreted to include a right of access to information held by public authorities. The default position must be that public authorities have an affirmative policy of releasing all relevant information in ways that are understandable to a non-technical pub public and that advance public health priorities. My predecessor, Frank LaRue, noted that the design and implementation of freedom of information laws should be guided by principles of maximum disclosure, an obligation to publish, the promotion of open government, a limited scope of exceptions, processes to facilitate access, and disclosure taking precedent, precedence over exceptions. Article 19, the free expression non-governmental organization, described the underlying purposes well, quote, Information allows people to scrutinize the actions of a government and is the basis for proper, informed debate of those actions. A public health threat strengthens the arguments for open government, for it is only by knowing the full scope of the threat posed by disease that individuals and their communities can make appropriate personal choices and public health decisions. A government that deprives the public of reliable information puts individuals at risk and can justify such deprivation only on the narrowest grounds and with the greatest degree of necessity to protect a legitimate interest. One of the mechanisms used by governments to ensure public access to information is to provide media access to officials, to documentation, and other resources. This may include regular press briefings in which public health and other officials provide detailed information to the public and answer questions from an independent media. Unfortunately, there have been reports of several instances involving direct interference with this mode of actively providing access to information. These types of restrictions tend toward closing off access to reliable information, disabling independent journalists from addressing questions to officials and thus clarifying public health orders and limit the ability to hold officials accountable for the decisions they make during the pandemic. The openness of government to media is especially important when public officials provide inconsistent, unclear, or otherwise confusing information to the public. The goal in a public health crisis must be for government to provide accurate information or information that is as accurate as possible and framed appropriately as uncertain or evolving and clear and honest guidance. As the WHO has noted, risk communication is a two-way street. The media provide an essential tool for governments to understand the concerns of the public and for the public to understand how to manage their concerns and fears. Limiting access limits this crucial element of information sharing. Second, access to the internet. In a moment of global pandemic, the right of access to the internet should be restated and seen for what it is, a critical element of healthcare policy and practice, public information, and even the right to life. Indeed, an open and secure internet should be counted among the leading prerequisites for the enjoyment of the freedom of expression today, yet governments have resorted increasingly to the bluntest forms of denial of access to information via the internet, knowing that digital tools have become an essential, if not for many, the essential, tool for the enjoyment of the right to seek, receive, and impart information. Turkey has not been immune to this kind of repressive action, with blunt censorship, the blocking of Wikipedia, the most obvious, but not the only example, too often a tool of information management. Given the migration of all manner of essential services to online platforms, shutdowns not only restrict expression, but also interfere with other fundamental rights. In the context of the pandemic, it has been especially troubling to observe the continuation of several instances of internet shutdowns in India, 
Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. Internet shutdowns are an affront to the freedom of expression that every person is guaranteed. Shutdowns during a pandemic risk the health and life of everyone and that of others with whom people come into contact. There is no room for limitation of internet access at a time of a health emergency that affects everyone from the most local to the global level. Third, let me address the protection and promotion of independent media. The first person to deliver this lecture, Ahmed Altan, knows the following all too well. Journalism plays an essential role in the communication of information to the public, enabling individuals to exercise their rights to seek and receive information and to develop opinions about the threats that they face so that they can take appropriate steps to protect themselves and their communities. This is indeed a moment to reinforce the fundamentally important role of a free, uncensored, and unhindered media to self-governance. It is something the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly have repeatedly emphasized. Yet the pandemic has already exposed numerous threats to journalism, with an increasing number of reports indicating that governments attack the messenger and limit reporting rather than act responsibly on information disclosed. In Turkey, where P24 has estimated over 100 media workers are in prison, the ongoing repression of journalism must end. Those detained must be released, whether they are journalists or activists or others detained for their views, whether they are fact finders, reporters, others. I urge the government to take swift, swift action to do so. So here are some of the key issues facing journalism today. One, I've already mentioned the failure to release journalists from prison. The Committee to Protect Journalists has stated that more than 250 journalists are currently in prison. No media worker should be in prison by reason of their work. And yet those journalists, subjected to arbitrary and unlawful detention, now face the additional risk of their health and lives. Whether states wish to frame their releases as humanitarian or not, it is imperative that all states release any journalists in their custody. It is critical that any state that continues to criminalize journalism, including under the guise of prohibiting defamation or countering terrorism, does not pursue such cases during the pandemic, given the additional risk posed by detention. And over the long term, it is also critical that states repeal any laws criminalizing journalism, including under the those adopted under the guise of addressing terrorism or defamation or under other categories. Police intimidation of journalists. Numerous reports from around the world indicate growing intimidation of journalists reporting on the pandemic, detention and questioning of journalists, and other forms of repression of media workers and human rights defenders conducting fact-finding inquiries concerning COVID-19. That intimidation must stop. There are also political attacks on journalists. The full protection of journalists cannot properly be achieved amidst a culture that devalues free expression and denies respect to people who seek to exercise freedom of expression. There have been persistent attacks on journalists and civil society figures in the past few years, such as those arising in Turkey, the United States, Hungary, Thailand, the Philippines, and elsewhere. Of course, in that context, it's impossible to forget the killing of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul by Saudi authorities, a killing for which there has been no accountability. A lack of an enabling environment for media work. Given the essential role of media workers, governments should be enabling them to continue their work, including where appropriate by classifying journalism as essential. When conducting their work, Media workers should be provided with protections deemed necessary in the pandemic, such as protective masks and other relevant gear. An enabling environment also involves the holding of open press conferences that include independent media and ensuring that all media outlets, not just state-owned media, have access to public officials and other information sources. And of course, there is a lack of protection of access for foreign journalists. 
the global nature of the COVID-19 crisis militates in favor of ensuring reporting that is available across borders. In particular, this means that governments should not take steps to interfere with reporting from the international press. Unfortunately, there have been several reported instances of hostility directed by governments at foreign press representatives. Fourth, let me turn to my final topic, public health disinformation. The Director General of the World Health Organization has noted that, quote, fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous, end quote. WHO calls it an infodemic, a term you've probably heard, which involves, quote, the rapid spread of information of all kinds, including rumors, gossip, and unreliable information, end quote. Public health authorities around the world have been legitimately concerned about disinformation during the pandemic. Unreliable information, particularly when disseminated by individuals with significant platforms, can cause grave harm, whether maliciously intended or not. WHO has stated that, quote, successful management of infodemics will be based on, one, monitoring and identifying them, two, analysis of them, and three, control and mitigation measures, end quote. The thrust of the WHO guidance emphasizes risk communication, including engagement with rumors in order to correct them. This general guidance, which is silent on whether prohibiting false information is legitimate, nonetheless suggests consistency with the position taken by human rights monitors and experts. The principles of legality and necessity should be applied to any approach to disinformation. In particular, disinformation as a concept is extraordinarily elusive, very difficult to define in law, susceptible to providing executive authorities with excessive discretion to determine what is disinformation, what is a mistake, and what is truth. Moreover, any attempts to criminalize information relating to the pandemic may create distrust in institutional information. It may delay access to reliable information, and it may have a chilling effect on the sharing of expression, the freedom of expression. In other words, the penalization of disinformation is disproportionate, failing to achieve its goal of tamping down information while instead deterring individuals from sharing what could be valuable information. While much of the public discussion concerning false pandemic information concerns the steps government and private companies should take to remove such information or punish those who spread it, it is important to begin with government itself. Unfortunately, there are numerous instances Unfortunately, there are numerous instances of state actors disseminating unverified and often reckless claims about the origins of the COVID-19 virus. The responsibility for the pandemic, the presence or extent of COVID-19 in their country, and the availability of drugs to counter the symptoms and other harmful assertions, such claims which are always sooner or later shown to be false, undermine trust in government sources of information, which in turn may generate such public distrust that it becomes difficult for public health authorities to promote effective and proven policies. Disinformation concerning the COVID-19 pandemic is circulating in traditional and social media worldwide. Some pertains to troubling political blame games relating mainly to interstate disputes and are not conducive to the kind of international cooperation necessary to meet the challenge of the pandemic. Other forms may be more dangerous, such as information related to quarantines, purported healthcare advice, and other unverified claims that, if widely pursued, could cause harm to the health of individuals. Any government efforts to counter such information, disinformation should be based on the principles outlined above. Full, honest, and evolving communication with the public, the promotion and protection of an independent press, and the careful and public correction of misinformation that could lead to public health harm. Beyond the pandemic, states should take steps to ensure an enabling environment for independent media and educational settings that promote media literacy and otherwise give individuals 
critical thinking tools to distinguish between verifiable and unverifiable claims. In the brief period since the COVID-19 outbreak and transformation into a pandemic, a number of states have adopted laws purportedly aimed at sanctioning disinformation concerning the pandemic. Some such laws may be legitimately aimed at protecting privacy rights with respect to a person's infection status. Those provisions must be consistent with the standards set out in Article 17 of the Covenant. In general, however, the approach, the approach should reflect the aspects referred to by the Human Rights Commissioner of the Council of Europe, Dunja Miatovic, when she urged Council of Europe member states to ensure, and I will quote her in full, that measures to combat disinformation are necessary, proportionate, and subject to regular oversight, including by parliament and national human rights institutions. Measures to combat disinformation must never prevent journalists and media actors from carrying out their work or lead to content being unduly blocked on the internet. Those countries which have introduced restrictions that do not meet those standards must repeal them as a matter of urgency. That is Dunja Miatovic. Now, private search engine and social media companies are justifiably under significant pressure to ensure that they do not enable potentially harmful public health disinformation to circulate on their platforms. Several have already taken aggressive steps to address misinformation about the COVID-19 virus. Many have developed approaches to ensure that whenever a person searches for information related to the disease, an early search result, result, an early search result includes verified information from a public health authority. Others are reinforcing their existing policies, for instance, by removing content that may, quote, discourage people from seeking medical treatment or claim that harmful substance of, substances have health benefits. That is from YouTube. Twitter is expanding its definition of harm to include, quote, content that goes directly against guidance from authoritative sources of global and local public health information, end quote. One analyst found that platforms were taking an unusually aggressive approach in removing misinformation and other exploitative content and boosting trusted content like information from WHO. At the same time, public health measures such as social distancing have led companies to drastically reduce their content moderation workforce, leading to an increase in the use of tools of automation and the admission of likely mistakes. As has been evident during the COVID-19 pandemic, social media and search companies have an enormous impact on public discourse and the rights of individuals on and off their platforms. There's a potential for mistakes, particularly in the context of the emphasis on tools of automation that could cause significant public health harms. Such harm could be caused by, among other things, the takedown of verified and beneficial public health information which thereafter could attract a negative rep reputation because of the initial takedown, or a failure to remove content or users sharing unverified information that could lead to health risks. There's also the potential for viewpoint discrimination. Thus, when addressing issues such as the posting of information about public protests inconsistent with governmental guidelines during the pandemic, social media companies should ensure that their policies apply to all such gatherings and do not discriminate on the basis of the protesters' viewpoints. These responsibilities are heavy, and it is particularly difficult for companies to do their required human rights due diligence when their employees are unable to hold regular meetings, dispersed as they are because of public health policies. Nonetheless, that responsibility persists, especially during the pandemic. And so in seeking to meet the responsibilities to prevent or mitigate human rights harms during the pandemic, it is essential that the companies conduct ongoing due diligence to determine the impact their content policies are having on the rights to health and to life. Given the nature of the public threat, they should aim towards maximum transparency of their policies and engage on an urgent basis, not only with public health authorities, but with affected communities wherever they operate. 
they should especially review their policies and their practices to ensure that content moderators are available as soon as possible to review COVID-19 information as reliance solely on automation may have a deleterious impact on health and human rights. In conclusion, I wanna urge all who care about freedom of expression, all who care about a robust and independent media to be vigilant in protecting our fundamental right to information, much as P24 is. We must be vigilant in the face of government efforts to use this crisis to expand their power. We must be vigilant in the face of our own self-censorship at a time of serious public health threat. And we must be vigilant in our continuing advocacy of the release of all journalists detained, whether in Turkey or elsewhere around the world, and demand that governments meet their obligations and not turn this pathogen into yet another tool of repression. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank David Kay again for giving such a really comprehensive and detailed analysis of the situation that we are faced with in such a clear set of recommendations and outlines for best practices. Um, David Kay is with us um, and he is happily agreed to answer questions. In order to ask a question, you have to click on the participants um, uh, logo at the bottom of your screen. And then there's a, once you get there, you'll, there'll be an option of raising your hand um, and asking you, uh, and asking a question. Um, David, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Thank you again. I, I hope you heard my, my fulsome thanks for your presentation. You look even better in person. Thank you. Can I say uh, uh, to everybody? That's about the extent of my, my Turkish, but I know it's evening over there. People tease, say that that's probably the extent of mine as well, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so it, um, while, while you're figuring out how to, how to uh, raise your hand and ask the questions, uh, let me step into the breach and, and ask, uh, use the chair's prerogative. I mean, basically this was a, a series of what should happen. Um, and of course we know that it's not what does happen. Um, what, it, perhaps this is a deliberately naive question, but what measures, what sanctions, what pressure can be brought to those governments, corporations, et cetera, who don't follow your advice? That's, uh, that's the perennial question for all of us, I think, um, particularly at a moment when there is, uh, there's so much repression of, of journalism, so much repression of freedom of expression around the world. And some of the voices that, that many of us used to rely upon in order to, if not enforce others obligations under human rights law, um, but at least condemn abuses and bring their own, whether it's bilateral pressure or regional pressure on other states. Many of those voices are not as active as they used to be. So we're, um, so we're in a bit of a troubling moment from, from that perspective. I do think um, that there are tools that, that we can use. And I know that um, that there are many, many who are within your, uh, within your community who use the tools of law. And the, the kind of litigation that you've done uh, and others who are on this call have done for, um, for instance, in, in Turkish courts, in the constitutional court, um, I believe it may be that Yaman Akdeniz is, is uh, with us now also, and he and, and others of you were instrumental in, um, in bringing the cases and leading the charge on issues such as the Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia case in Turkey uh, and, uh, and litigation at the European Court of Human Rights. I think that's the kind of thing that, that you know, where we have those kinds of tools, we should continue to use them. Um, and you know, I certainly stand ready to support any of those kinds of activities uh, that you're doing. There's also, I should say, 
the, the Human Rights Council, which is still operating. And my hope is that there'll be opportunities, whether in June or September, the upcoming sessions, to, to highlight uh, both the bad practices that we're seeing around the world and, and hopefully some best practice that, um, that might be emerging in other parts of the world. Thank you. Um, Yaman Akhtiniz is with us and, and he's raised his hand and wants to ask a question. So can I call upon him to, to, to ask away? Yaman, are you there? I think you have to unmute yourself. Can you see me? Right. Well, can. Oh, excellent. Uh, hello, uh, Andrew. Uh, hello, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, I can see Yasemin. And um, um, I will be quick. Uh, we just released, uh, David, today some uh, internet censorship related uh, statistics on uh, through the Twitter account uh, of our Ifadez Gülü Derni. And uh, we reached the number of 415,000 blocked websites from Turkey, in addition to 140,000 URL addresses, so news articles and social media content. Uh, 42,000 tweets we found uh, blocked from Turkey. Uh, over 12,000 individual uh, YouTube videos, 7,200 Twitter accounts, and uh, 6,500 uh, Facebook uh, content. And in addition to that, uh, in the last three to four weeks, uh, over 3,500 investigations on social media accounts, uh, the Ministry of Interior announced, over 600 criminal investigations and um, over 200 social me media detentions. These are all um, connected to uh, COVID-19 pandemic related uh, criticism. Uh, so uh, how do you see countries like Turkey in the post uh, COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, we will continue to fight of course, but uh, uh, it takes uh, over um, two and a half years of my life uh, to successfully challenge the Wikimedia, Wikipedia uh, blocking. It took in the past uh, almost uh, four years to challenge uh, the YouTube blocking decision at the European Court of Human Rights level. So first of all, how do you see uh, a country like Turkey in the post COVID-19 pandemic? And secondly, um, wh what can we do uh, more uh, to um, quicken it and uh, challenge these uh, uh, governmental uh, initiatives, uh, which you will probably see more, not just uh, in relation to Turkey. Yeah, the, Yaman, those are, those are striking figures that you mentioned. And um, I mean, it's, it's good to see you, I should say, hello first. Um, but those are, those are really striking figures and it suggests uh, a, a ramping up of censorship, which is, as I, as I tried to emphasize in my talk and in my recent report, um, you know, clamping down on information at a time of, uh, of public health crisis is exactly the wrong approach to take to freedom of expression. And of course, there are issues around disinformation that, um, that we need to be really vigilant about. But um, but those kinds of approaches are, are deeply problematic. And, and I think one of my main concerns as, as we look at what's happening today and as your question is asking about the future, one of my main concerns is that states will use the current moment in order to lock in approaches that they've wanted to uh, uh, take for many years that are repressive of freedom of expression. I mean, there was this issue um, within the last couple of weeks around the omnibus bill in Turkey, in which the government initially sought to include some really um, quite troubling uh, intermediary liability and other uh, internet related rules that had nothing to do with the public health crisis. And I'm concerned that, that not just Turkey, but others as well will use this opportunity, an opportunity in which there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of distraction, but there's also a lot of uh, perhaps deference to governments. I'm concerned that they'll use this moment 
I, I think there's another part of this, though, that, that governments should be really extremely careful about. And, and that is that the extent to which they use their, the tools of information management in order to restrict expression during the COVID pandemic. Um, and as a result, people have less information and it contributes to a worsening of the health crisis. I think that, that really undermines public trust in government. It, it undermines public trust in um, authoritative sources of public health information. And so there's a real long-term threat that, uh, that I think if governments are not paying attention to that, uh, over the long term, they are hurting themselves in addition to undermining um, you know, freedom of expression and, and the other values that, that, that you pursue throughout your career and that P24 is dedicated to. So, um, so I'm anxious and worried about what, what comes next. Uh, and I think that leads to the, the second question, sort of what do we do? And I think, you know, it's easy for me to say here in California where I don't have the threat of detention um, to say this, but I think we need to continue to be vocal about the importance of freedom of expression in all of these different places around the world where, where there's repression. Um, my hope is that governments will, will make, for example, the call for the release of all journalists, of all those who are working in media to release from detention. My, my, my hope would be that governments would use today, World Press Freedom Day, to, uh, to emphasize that point, and as a bilateral matter, to, uh, to really say to governments that are holding journalists, it's time to release them, and to use whatever tools of pressure and sanction that they have in order to do that. We're not seeing that. We need to encourage governments that do have uh, the, you know, the potential levers of pressure to do that, and, and my hope, and, and we've seen this from people like Dunya Miatovic, who I mentioned, from Harlan Desir in the OSCE, and from others who are really emphasizing these points, and I think we need to continue to do that even more vociferously in the, in the coming days. Oh, thank you, David. Thanks, Yaman. Anyway, and thank you for that reply. We have time for, I guess, just one or two more questions. Um, Oya, uh, um, can I call upon you? Who is that? Yes, this is Oya. Uh, Hello. Oya, yeah. Oya from Transparency International. Um, oh, that Oya. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that, that Oya. Um, and this is actually pretty much like a follow-up question for David. And, and I know that he has been uh, answering at least partly. But what I'm just asking uh, specifically uh, for Turkey, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Yaman gave, um, you know, some of the very concerning numbers already. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, since this pandemic started, we have this narrative that nothing is going to be the same. I think it has been proved in Turkey that everything is going to be the same uh, when it comes to the press freedom and, um, you know, freedom of information and all. Um, so, I understand your general view, but when it comes to Turkey, and uh, do you have, I know that, you know, you have uh, obviously regular contacts and, you know, correspondences with the authorities, but um, I mean, do you have any current questioning, any immediate reaction, and what could be the answers for that? And this is pretty much that I would like, uh, I'm, um, I'm wondering, because uh, I know that, I mean, it's not only Turkey, obviously, um, the, uh, there are a number of other countries and then they, they have been using uh, this public health issue as a security issue and it's a way of uh, concealing information. And, but we are in Turkey and then we are uh, experiencing this very severely. Uh, so what, is your uh, view and uh, especially mm -hmm. you know any concrete answer or reaction from the authorities thank you yeah that's it's an important question i wish we had more time so that i could so that i could hear from you <laughs> um 
and others on the call because, you know, as, as you know, and others on the call know, uh, I visited Turkey in 2016. Uh, we've been engaged with the government over time. Since then, we've raised all of the concerns uh, that we had and, and continue to have originally around the, um, the declared emergency and around, you know, what we've seen as the, really the redefinition of journalism as terrorism. We've, we've seen the, obviously the detentions, uh, the, the, the firings of academics and civil servants. Um, it's, it's been, um, you know, really kind of a, a, a tsunami of, of bad news. And we've engaged with the government repeatedly and we've seen very little change. And, um, and I am concerned that the same kind of use of, of the emergency from after uh, 2016, from July of 2016, might be um, revived for the purposes of, of public health. Um, so I think that, I mean, I would welcome any suggestions that people have, and you can, you can send them directly to me, you can send them through Andrew, um, however, uh, however it works. But, um, but I think certainly public statements um, would probably be, be useful for us to do. Um, from, from my perspective, the more specifics, so like Yaman's um, uh, details of the way in which the government is using the old tools of censorship to shut down criticism related to, to COVID-19, I'd be very interested in seeing material like that and specific instances that we can raise directly with the government. And, and we'll try to do that through our normal channels, which are essentially confidential, but then become public after a certain amount of time, but also through, through public channels, such as press statements and, and so forth. So anything you can share that you think would be useful for us to use in that context would be, would be extremely valuable and would allow us to be a little bit more concrete with our, uh, with our concerns. And I would say also, that my recent report could be a could provide a kind of framework for the kinds of concerns that we might raise with with particular governments, including uh, with Ankara. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question, or maybe two, if someone wants to ask one. But Peter Eriksson, Consul General of Sweden, uh, has raised his hand. Can we hear from you? Thank you very much and thank you so much, Professor Kafi, for a very interesting and very concrete uh, <coughs> intervention. Uh, as you pointed out, and as my minister also pointed out before, uh, several governments are taking the opportunity to sort of uh, uh, increase their grip on the society and even in Sweden, if I may say so, uh, <coughs> Parliament has approved extraordinary powers to the government, which uh, for the purposes of, uh, of this uh, combating the disease, even though they haven't been used yet and they don't uh, specifically address uh, freedom of the press or freedom of information, but other parts of, sort of human rights and the liberties that we usually enjoy. And my question is, is it at all conceivable that there could be some kind of an international framework developed uh, where we would somehow in the UN context or elsewhere uh, try to agree that okay so now COVID-19 uh, is no longer uh, as threatening as it was, it takes some time, uh, and therefore it's time to roll back whatever uh, sort of extra powers that, that governments have granted themselves or their parliaments have granted them. Uh, it's maybe an issue in Turkey, there are several other countries, of course, where this may also be uh, a problem. I don't have to name them. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for, for that comment. And thank you, well, to you and to your minister for, for participating today. I, I think that's a, it's a really important suggestion. And, and it seems to me that, um, you know, particularly because the World Health Organization's guidance around managing epidemics and pandemics has been very clear 
that, um, that uh, freedom of expression and freedom of information goes hand in hand with, um, although hand in hand may be the wrong way to put it while we're social distancing, um, but it goes hand in hand with fighting the disease and addressing uh, the, the pandemic. And, and it seems to me that, that the World Health Organization could be a part of a, a global effort, a, um, a collaborative and multilateral effort, both to ensure that uh, information and uh, expression are part of the answer to the pandemic, but also that all of the emergency approaches that are taken right now are agreed upon among governments as being limited to the purposes of the pandemic. Um, and that, um, and as I reference in my report, that there be an end date, that there be basically sunset provisions on all of the laws that are adopted in order to address the pandemic. And, and it may be, and I'm really delighted that your government is a part of this because Sweden has been, I think, although taking a different approach than, than others, has been a very strong supporter of freedom of expression historically and for the purposes of my mandate in particular. And I think that you know, to the extent that governments like yours, um, others that are strong supporters of freedom of expression, um, but also uh, strong supporters of multilateralism and of the WHO can, can find a way to, to bring people together on some of these key points. I think that would be um, uh, remarkably effective and also be a way to, to leverage the values of human rights at a particular moment of, of health threat. Okay, well, if, if there are no more questions, I'll, I'll, I just have the pleasurable duty of, of thanking David for what has been an extraordinarily clear presentation of the challenges and issues we confront. Um, but I think more than that, I think he's, by appearing with us this evening, um, by showing his support, by, by just being with us, has, has encouraged us, has shown a sense of solidarity, which is so important um, uh, for us and an encouragement to do things that are not always that easy to do, to, to speak out and to, to fight for, for basic rights and, and, and to fight for our colleagues who, who face injustice. So it's not a trivial thing that you've done. It's not the, the thanks that I give you this evening are not perfunctory by any means. Um, we really are very grateful and appreciative of the work that you have done as rapporteur, but also for your being with us this evening. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks to everybody for joining. Stay safe, and, and I hope we can be in touch and see each other in person in, in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Yes, and thank you, of course.